The Marine Accident Investigation Branch of the British government has released its interim report into the sinking of the Bayesian superyacht. I'm pleased to say we're once again joined by Nick Sloan, an engineer who works in marine salvage and is best known for leading the Costa Concordia salvage operation back in 2013. So, Nick, uh, this is a 10 page report, uh, a lot of detail. Uh, various media organizations have picked up on different aspects of this report. For you, what's the most important aspect of the report? Matthew, I think, uh, you know, with, with the report being released yesterday and having had a, a, a couple of uh, reads over it, obviously it's the initial report and they, they, they're going to come out with a more detailed one once the actual yacht's recovered and they can do a more detailed inspection. But it, it does indicate that there was um, not only bad weather, but a, a, a really... Um, sudden increase in the weather conditions between sort of quarter to four in the morning and five past four, six minutes past four when the actual capsize occurred. And if you look at the um, the drift of the radars of the weather um, system that was approaching, and it, it actually comes into the shallow waters of the Bay of Palomo and then over the headland, and the headland's got quite, quite uh, big mountains and hills on it, so that actually increases into what they call a wind shear. And that wind shear can increase the wind speed substantially. And then it hits the actual, the, the water between the headland and where the yacht was itself. And that causes the wind to tumble down the mountainside and a add into the sort of um, the potential for cyclonic uh, action and a water spout. And with the sudden increase of wind from sort of 30 knots. Now 30 knots is already 4.7 um which is quite substantial and then it, it sort of doubled it, it went right up to 70 knots very suddenly um which is well over hurricane forces and obviously uh, with the modeling that they managed to carry out at the university of southampton um anything over 64 knots uh, could lead to quite a major loss of stability for the yacht with the keel up and uh, obviously looking at the reports and from the witness accounts um, it was very sudden between four o'clock and five minutes past four. You know, conditions became really extreme. That's right. The details in the report revealed that at 3.55 a.m., the deckhand posted a video of the advancing storm on social media. And at that point, it was the winds were at around 35 miles an hour. Um, at 3.57, the crew seemed to have noticed that the vessel was dragging its anchor. And at 4 a.m., you know, just a couple of minutes later they woke the skipper and then within six minutes of waking the skipper the vessel was knocked over and and as you've just explained it was all incredibly sudden and 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 that would um correlate with the with that type of weather pattern so the the, the low system was coming down from genoa which is in the Tyrrhenian sea and um it's quite a long stretch so it, it's building momentum and of course then it hits the very warm waters from the shallow bay of Palermo and it gets more energy into that system and that can trigger these cyclonic, uh, the cyclonic, the sort of water spouts and, and these really sudden and extreme weather conditions. As you mentioned, the University of Southampton carried out modelling and it found out uh, that wind speeds over 73 miles per hour could topple the yacht. Um, it's been reported that the crew and indeed the owners were not aware uh, that winds over 73 miles per hour could topple the yacht. How would how should they have been made aware of that? So 73 knots of wind is extreme. So that's well above hurricane force. Um, and I think if you're going to be in, in the Caribbean or any other part of the world where you get cyclones and uh, typhoons, um, it's going to be well forecast, and, and if you are unfortunate enough to be in that way, you're certainly going to have the keel down, you're going to be completely um, set up to survive that sort of weather phenomenon. Uh, when that happens at this point, so normally you would have the wind coming almost directly over the bow uh, when you hove to, but here, because of the sudden uh, wind shear and, and the, the cyclonic action of the of the water spout and, and almost a tornado, uh, that, that wind changes, and it was reportedly to be just off the port bow, 
And then suddenly it came onto the beam and they were completely knocked over 90 degrees. Um, so I don't think anyone would be expected to be fully aware of that. Normally, you know, weather patterns, um, the weather deteriorates and you have we have time at sea to prepare for it and actually to alter course and reduce the impact. But when it comes over the headland like that, and the forecast was for force four to five, which is 18 to 23, 24 knots. And now you're talking about 60, 70 and 70 plus knots. It's a completely different weather system. Very sudden, very extreme and very localized. It might only be 50 meters to 150 meters in, in diameter. That, that, um, that little system. It's also mentioned in the report that during the previous day, the Bayesian was sailed to the site. Uh, where it later sank, in order to shelter uh, from the forecast uh, thunderstorms. Uh, forgive me uh, for this layman question, but did the skipper pick an inappropriate place or was it just uh, the, a terribly unlucky um, thing to happen, given that other uh, yachts in the area were fine? Yep, um, so that's a good question, Matthew, but I think it is a good shelter. Uh, the wind was coming down from the northwest, so you get a nice bit of shelter you know, from the Bay of Palermo where they were anchored. And certainly for Force 4 and Force 5, what they were forecast with thunderstorm activities, they shouldn't be a problem. And I think the fact that it's so localized, mm -hmm. so the weather system picked up and both yachts, uh, I think the other yacht was also dragging anchor around about 3.57 in the morning. Um, and then again, because they might be separated by a couple of hundred meters, um, the Bicean was just unfortunate hit by this in incredible extreme wind shear, and uh, that knocked it flat. What do you make of the behavior of the crew? Um, the oceanographer Simon Boxall has said it's clear from the report that the, uh, the crew did shut the hatches and the doors uh, so that um, we can now say that speculation about doors being left open, uh, allowing flooding, uh, are, are not true. Is is that are we that clear about it? Yeah, I would say that's 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 um, pretty apparent from the report. I mean, it's a well-found boat that's been sailing the oceans for many years, and and uh, you know, a crew, an experienced crew that know the boat well. So uh, I think that is. Um, certainly something that can be read from it. So if you think of the actions that the crew took from four o'clock in the morning when the deckhand went to wake the skipper, at the same time, the chief engineer woke up and he knew that something obviously was not normal. So he went straight away to the engine room, made, made sure that all three generators were running. And then uh, he moved up to the wheelhouse to engage the steering motors and the hydraulics. And, and that was pretty quick and prompt action from the chief engineer's point of view. At the same time, between four o'clock and let's say four or five minutes past four, um, the, the wind went from sort of 30 knots, well over 70 knots, tore off the awning of the upper wheelhouse, uh, the flybridge. And then they got hit by even further, um, what, what they didn't describe what they, were hit by, but obviously the wind even went from 70 knots, maybe up to over 100 knots. And they were just suddenly just not completely flat. And that would be very much in line with the cyclonic actions, this um, sort of water spout that's very localized, incredibly powerful. And if you get hit with weight of water, um, that, that's certainly going to have enough to knock you flat. So a lot happened between four and four or six. Um, quite terrifying if you if you read the accounts of you know the chief officer being trapped inside and had to swim underneath to actually escape and the others who were you know had to climb over whatever they could just to to get out so a very terrifying few minutes that they had before they went flat and obviously when they went flat then it was um very little that they could do and then she didn't come back up um, it, there was a report that the, the bow came out the water you know, as she went, and that would be, uh, if you think that the bow is quite a strong part of the yacht and would normally contain and trap uh, some air, so it would have more buoyancy, 
where the engine room's further down aft, and that's where the larger compartments are. So most most vessels would sink by the stern with the bow being large. So that also um, makes sense that uh, you know um, there was flooding when she went flat, and there was some buoyancy trapped in the lower deck and in the bow section itself. Nine months ago, when we covered this story, uh, one of our guests, a skipper, uh, made the point that that the crew would have been nervous to wake up very, very wealthy people uh, if they weren't very sure uh, that their lives were in danger. I think that can also be dismissed now. It really wasn't a question of, you know, they, they were trepidatious to wake up billionaires and, and millionaires. It's just that there wasn't time. Is that is that what you're concluding now from this report? I would say that that's um, if you think that between 3.57 and 4 o'clock conditions changed quite quickly that they went to wake up the skipper and they all responded. You know, the engineers went straight to the engine room, got that underway. You know, um, 30 knots is one thing and then 70 knots is a completely different thing. So when, when conditions are deteriorating that quickly, then they would. The, the main thing was to get the engines up and running and change the heading and obviously if it was a constant wind in a constant direction that might have helped but when it's it's a circular and a cyclonic and it's a, a water spout that wind direction changes so rapidly that literally you don't have any control and i, I would say in those two minutes uh, when she was upright at 20 degree list to be 90 degree list yeah, you, know, you just don't have time. But certainly, um, conditions were far worse than anyone had forecast or predicted. And it's just unfortunate that they were right in the path of whatever hit them. So if the winds have been steady and from a certain direction, then maneuvering the vessel would have had potentially a mitigating effect. But because it was cyclonic, there was nothing really that the skipper could do. Yes. So initially it was 20, 30 degrees on the bow. Then there was a report that it was broad on the bow, which would be 45 degrees, maybe 50 degrees. And then obviously uh, when they were suddenly knocked over, if you just have that that actual rotation and the circular rotation moving across the, the basin and changing rapidly the angle, um, well, at that, that wind speed, uh, you've literally got no no uh, chance of coming back upright. Nick, this is a 10-page report full of detail, um, but they've also mentioned at the beginning that it's a desktop assessment. Can you just very briefly tell us, uh, you know, how they carry these assessments out? They will make models of it, and um, the models are very accurate, you know, with computer-generated programs. They'll have the water depth, the uh, peninsula headland, and then the radar image of the of the wind. So then they can add all of those forces onto the mast, the rigging, um, and these these are quite complex models. And it will even pick up the sort of shadow of some of the rigging, how that rigging would impact the wind flow onto the mast. So if you have just the mast profile and you hit it with a wind force you'll get a certain uh, angle of heel. But also if you include all of the rigging, then uh, you get little eddies that are caused by the rigging and that impacts the mass. So the model itself sounds very detailed and very complex. And obviously the, the computer programs can, can uh, then run the model and the program to find out what the result is. So they, when they say desktop, it's actually computer generated desktop. But uh, they add in all of these factors, and as they get more information, then they can actually tweak the time, and especially that sudden increase of the wind from you know, the forecast of four, force four to force five, then 30 knots, and then 70 knots, and then something even beyond that. And Nick, it's being reported that the salvage operation has resumed, or is about to resume uh, after a pause, uh, following the tragic death of the diver uh, last week, uh, we understand that he was preparing to cut the mast uh, when he was fatally injured. What more can you tell us about that? What are your suspicions about what may have happened? The whole incident was very tragic, and it's something that any salvage team is your worst nightmare to actually have someone 
badly injured and let alone a fatality. Um, so there was report of an underwater explosion that was actually felt on the surface and uh, knocked knocked the barge, uh, the work barge on the surface. So they were working on separating the boom from the mast itself. And the boom has what they call a gooseneck fitting that goes into the mast. And it's quite a substantial mast and it's quite a substantial boom. Uh, they weren't able to release it with spanners. So they used what they call as an underwater cutting gun. It's called a broco. And that has high pressure oxygen with magnesium strips inside. And it actually is a cutting torch. And one of the byproducts of that whole process is you get a buildup of hydrogen gas. Um, even though it's quite a quick cut, um, not a substantial cut in, in underwater terms or diver terms, the fact is that you need to always have the buildup of hydrogen gas as a risk. And, and you, you normally make purge holes so that any gas buildup can be purged out the way and then avoid that risk. Um, it's quite a confined space, the boom. And obviously there was a buildup of hydrogen gas and then that ignited. And of course, at that depth at 49 meters or 50 meters, you have five times the density of water on the surface. So that concussion is incredibly powerful. And obviously they haven't released the cause of death, but if you have an underwater explosion at that depth, it's normally pretty tragic and, and fatal.